batteries. So just a real quick trip through here because I really am an advocate for putting power electronics in storage. And I'll show just a couple of slides on that. And this is one of the enablers uh, for doing this decoupled power and energy. So in a vehicle where we look at feeding the, the uh, traction inverter, this is in your battery electric car, for example, or your plug-in, and you have this large battery pack that wants to get you 100 miles or 200 miles or what have you, and the goal of the manufacturer is I don't want to wear it out because I don't want to have to carry a warranty on this thing past eight years or 10 years, how do you ensure that you don't wear it out? Today's strategy on hybrid cars, and I've talked to the chief program engineers at the different companies on this, and their strategy is, we're not gonna cycle the battery, we're gonna cycle the engine. They said, I just wish if you would quit shutting that engine off and back on every couple of seconds. Well, we do it because we don't wanna cycle the battery, because we know it's gonna kill it. And our warranty is holding for eight years or 10 years, and I wanna replace it in that eight years or 10 years. Well, I've already, and we have studies going on. Actually, we have work kicked off with Argon Labs doing exactly this. We take all of this cycling off that battery and push it onto a cycling, uh, a highly cyclable energy storage component, uh, capacitor. And the way to manage all of that is through electronics. There's an incredible amount of uh, electronic controls already going on in, in the um, automotive industry. I mean, Toyota's had these on the streets for over 10 years, and also in the utility industries. So it's not like it, it's not something new. In fact, this whole concept here is not new at all. I mean, uh, industry has been looking at this for decades. But I think it's getting to the point now where these semiconductor industry, these sort of devices are getting into the realm now of where they're affordable uh, for doing this. And they're gonna get even more affordable because there's funding going on now to push these out of silicon into what's called the post-silicon era, into silicon carbides and gallium nitrides, and push these switching frequencies out of the few handful of kilohertz up into the tens, hundreds of kilohertz, megahertz. So as you bring silicon carbide on board, for example, uh, you can be doing 200 kilohertz switching. If you see a magnetic component, it's going to really shrink. So be able to have a lot of throughput power uh, through these devices. So it's actually fairly straightforward to do uh, a one megawatt converter like this. Toyota, in a Toyota uh, Camry or a Lexus, they have 40 kilowatt converters, in the, and they're, they're running all the time. They've been running since 2004 and their products on the streets. They're reliable. But no one has made the final step here to putting in this highly cyclable energy where you can really offload that, uh, for example, a lithium cell, take the cycling off of it. So we've been studying that and actually with, teamed up with Argon Lab uh, doing this and others. And here's a, you can ignore or, or uh, visualize this is a lithium battery, this is a capacitor, this is that converter. And then here is either the vehicle drive or the utility point of common connection. It doesn't matter what it is. This applies sort of across the board. Now what we showed is if I control the energy flows between these and simultaneously maintain what the load demands. I like a vehicle because it's so like a utility. Your demand response, you know, it's, it's random. You don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what's going to happen next other than for a standard drive cycle. But I don't have to know. I just watch what happens, react to it, is one way. So if you look at the total demand, for example, uh, this is the current here, or you can think of it also as the power. This looks like wind, or, or maybe um, photovoltaic on a really cloudy day, right? <laughs> a lot of clouds going over. But anyway, uh, what you could do then, just to, this is just a short time sample out of a just one segment here. And what we've done is, you can see the, the uh, blue line has all been relegated to the capacitor with this control. And I don't show it on here. There's an energy, there's an energy management strategy of state machines running in the background that are managing these power and energy flows. And what it's done is it's completely 
or almost completely taken all that variability off the battery, pushed it into the capacitor side so that all the battery sees is that red line. It almost see, in this case, it turns out to be the cruise power, the average power, right through here. And you can see it's doing a pretty good job. And in all of the dynamics, the stop and go, the speeding up, slowing down, maneuvering, that's all been pushed over here. Yes, sir. Um, quick question. What is the length of time over which this, is this seconds or hours? What, what's that time frame? I can't tell along the bottom. No, I know you can't read it. The, the, this, is, this turns out to be a drive cycle. It's 1,400 seconds uh, total. And this turns out to be uh, maybe 100 and some seconds. Uh, just a snippet out of it. Good point. So the benefits are there. Now, you, it doesn't take much imagining to, to see that the battery that only has to do the red line is going to live longer than the battery that has to do this red over here. It's simply going to run hotter. And I just showed you what heat does to the battery. Yes, back. Um, now, you've shown this as a kind of optimized set, and, and I really think your concept of putting pieces together to sort of get the best of all, but why is it that you haven't gone like another step to, in other words, smooth the smoother so that you get progressively smoother responses by using more components? Is, that, is it because of the, the software or is it because of the technology? Uh, no, it's a good point. Uh, the answer to your question is it's strictly that strategy, the energy management strategy, just how far do you want to push this? But you bring up an even better point here, and I get asked that quite a bit. It's the relative sizing. You know, how big is this battery? How big is this capacitor? And it turns out, like I showed you a previous chart, right? There were 24 kilowatt hour, 48 kilowatt hour big battery packs. And then I said there can be this uh, capacitor to go along with it. It turns out the size of this capacitor is dictated strictly by the, profile, by the drive, how you're going to drive it. it. Has nothing to do with the size of a battery. So in a, any automotive application from a sedan to an SUV, for example, 100 watt hours of capacitor is all you need. It does all of, what I just showed you, it does all of that. So, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, John. Uh, Tom? I think one of the big things in this is when you start looking at the cost of the battery in these applications and you start looking at it at the cost of the kilowatt hour process, uh, experimental evidence first in, in small scale and, and, and then larger scale, uh, John's starting to point out, but I want to emphasize that, that it's adding the, the capacitor power management significantly increases the life of the battery, which significantly lowers the cost of the battery. I think that's the big advantage of doing this besides just performance. Yeah, that's a good point, Tom. Thank you. C can I just check the, um, over what? here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, so when we've tried to do this uh, at the level of a module actually using capacitors, um, the, the, the thing we got into was just the cost of that. I mean, it, it, it's oh, a absolutely. low cost component in theory, but actually manufacturing it at a scale and adapting it for a, a solar panel is proven to be very expensive. And so it, the cost benefit didn't work. I mean, it hasn't worked yet. And, and, and obviously there's, obviously a, there's gonna have to be a, some, some innovation to get the cost lower. Um, but w where is the cost benefit here? I'll get to some of that in, in just a minute, but I wanted just to address your, your question right now, because I get asked that quite a lot. And one of the points is, I, because I look back on automotive and, and how warranty is done for batteries. For, and that's why, for example, they, I'll cycle the engine instead of, instead of this. But it's true, putting this additional component on has been a real deterrent. Even asking, uh, for example, if I st stick to the automotive uh, example one, they're very reluctant to even put a second battery in the car, regardless. They're just not going to do it. You know, they'll rather make a little bit bigger one or, or do something different, but there, it's, it's just a finding a space to put it and what have you. My point on the capacitor is it doesn't take much. It's, you know, 100 watt hours versus 40 kilowatt hours, it's like, but, it, it, but that's all it takes. But the, to me, it's been the converter, the fact that I had to sandwich in here this power processing. But those are, uh, especially as we go into what I'll call this post-silicon era, that's going to really 
uh, certainly the, the packaging is going to shrink, shrink down tremendously. But it still is an issue of cost and how to work out the value uh, equation for that. And that's one thing that I have been looking at. And I'm well aware of the fact that you know, we're asking a lot. But then how much is it worth the battery lasting 20 years or 25 years? Wind wants 25 years if you put this uh, storage out there. So how do you get from 6 to 10 to 15 to 25? You can't use the battery as we do today to do something different. Yes? Um, this, this device, the blue device in between, is that highly amenable to an ASICS approach that, you know, in other words, you embed the software and strategy into a physical device, then just make lots of them? Yep. Or is it more sort of a generalized device and software sitting on top of it? You can do it both ways. Would, one, would, you can, one, you can just, you know, do it in firmware, you know, put it into your uh, ASIC or your EEPROM. The other one is you can leave it open and, and have a, have, how would it, I call it, an adaptive strategy. Or you could put in neural nets or, or uh, artificial, it's wide open. I point out to, to people that it's not, in, it's not in these more actuator ends here, the storage f f uh, pieces themselves. It's, it's here in the, it's in the strategy. That's where the real benefit is. You can really make this, it's the DNA in car terminology. It's, I want to do it my way. And this will be different than the way anybody else is doing it. You can do all of that uh, sort of stuff. And by saying that, I mean, you can do what you asked earlier. You can say, well, how much do you want this here? How much do you want to have the battery uh, dynamic to be? Do you want to have this perfectly flat? I mean, exactly like the cruise power, the base load? Or do you want to have some little bit come through? Totally flexible. Yes? So, sorry, this is uh, Carl Capone from Shell again. So for somebody like me who's completely ignorant uh, of, of how this works, if I go back to your original slides, you showed a power versus energy chart and sort of the holy grail was up at the right-hand corner. Does this help you get there then? Does this allow you yeah. to sort of go to the point where you could, you could so this main, yeah. you, you basically now can manage a controlled right. amount of energy for a cheaper battery without the safety issues because you won't be going so much in temperature, right? That's kind of where you're, That's exactly your head right. with this. So it allows right. you to get up there and hit all of those right. big points. Okay, right. thank you. Because uh, uh, you can see it from here, this battery doesn't have to address these high peaks it doesn't have to do that one right there, for example. And that's even in, if you talk to the manufacturers of battery electrics or, or hybrid electric, there's, they come along every so often, these points here, that they're hard pressed to hit. But with a power optimized component here, there's, there's no reason you can't hit those. So you get your performance and you get your range. Or in the case of in the utility, you get your regulation and you get your time shifting. So there, it, and this battery is the true energy one. I said they're, they're, the closest you get now are the high temperature, you notice the sodium sulfur, the 300 degree C batteries, or nickel, uh, nickel metal chloride, those uh, uh, sodium nickel chloride rather. Those batteries, those can be the true energy batteries or some as yet uh, innovation in those. But the, uh, my point is, is that by putting optimized power and optimized energy together and managing it with a strategy, then you can achieve this much wider, broader goal. So if I move on here, one of the other things I um, presented at the Advanced Battery Conference was, so where would you put this converter and how can you do it even without a converter? And I summarize it in a, in a table here, one of, of uh, putting a converter and on the, on the capacitor and boosting the voltage up, that's what Toyota does in their products. Putting it on the capacitor at a voltage higher than the battery and converting down or putting the converter on the battery. You can look at all the possibilities. And, it's, and it was interesting to me that the top two didn't make one single change to this, the strategy running. And it just started off and ran and did both of those Exactly the same, even though levels were flipped uh, and all that went on, the strategy knew what to do. Uh, and then completely changing it, then they have to uh, uh, rewrite part of it. But you get some, you, you, the, the point I want to make is it's so flexible uh, in, uh, in both architecture and strategy. 